All right. Well, thank you to everyone so much for joining us on this lovely Tuesday evening. My name is Sarah White. I am the Community Engagement Coordinator with the Northampton County Historical and Genealogical Society. Uh, we shorten it to NCHGS. Um, the, the mission of NCHGS is to share the stories of Northampton County's past to encourage political, uh, personal reflection, excuse me, um, community dialogue and an understanding of history's impact on our lives. It is our vision that through the exploring of local history, we will foster a more respectful, caring and inclusive community. The Sigel Museum, where NCHGS is based and where I am right now, is home to a significant collection of pre-European settlement artifacts, curated, loaned, and donated in collaboration with the Lenape Nation of Pennsylvania and members of our local community. Our newest permanent exhibit, Destination Northampton County, tells the stories of some people who have settled in Northampton County long ago as well as today. We encourage you to become a member of NCHGS for invitations to opening receptions, free museum admission, and free access to our research library. For more information on our exhibits and our programs, please visit sigilmuseum.org. Our In Conversation series, of which today is a part, brings together community leaders, artists, and activists in dialogue regarding the many issues that affect our communities, both past and present. We will have a question and answer period following the conversation, so please feel free to use the chat feature at the bottom of your screen if you have any questions for Dr. Alone. We will respond to as many as our time allows. I'm going to briefly introduce Siri and then we'll get the conversation going. Um, Dr. Siri Lung is a medical sociologist and a health service researcher who is an associate professor of sociology and health, medicine, and society at Lehigh University. Her work focuses on the social production of health and disease and the role of social structures and institutions in creating health inequities across the globe. In particular, she explores how racism and other structures of exclusion shape health over the course of life. She is also the founding co-director of the Institute on Critical Race and Ethnic Studies and the chair of the Health Justice Collaborative at Lehigh University. So we'll just start with, um, Siri, could you tell us a little bit, uh, a little more about yourself and what is it that led you to choosing to become a medical sociologist? Yeah, so thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you um, everyone for, for, for being here. Uh, so I, I, was, I, was, I was born and raised in, in Cameroon and it's a country in West, West Central Africa. It was uh, first colonized, well, it was, it was discovered by the, by, the, by the Portuguese and then um, colonized by the Germans and then um, later on the French and the English, or the French and the British. And, um, and then it gained independence in um, 1961. And um, when, I, when I think about my interest in medical sociology and in sort of the social production of disease and illness, I, I always remember this moment when I was nine, 10, maybe at the most 11. And there was this woman in a neighborhood. Um, I thought she was really, really old. But you know, I was a child and like children think people are like always so old, but I thought she was like really old. I thought she was older than my mom. I thought my mom was old. And, <laughs> and so I told my mom that, um, no, I didn't. My mom said something one day about how that they were, they were the same age or that maybe my mom was even older than her. And I remember being really shocked because this woman, we called her Mami Frida. This woman, I thought she was just like really old and sick. And my mom said, no, that she's not old, but they were either the same age or my mom was older than her. I said, then why, why does she look so old and why does she look so sick? And my mom said it was because of stress, that she was dealing with a lot of, of stress. Um, it was because she's impoverished. It's, it's because there are just so many things that she has to do and she doesn't really have the resources and she's just trying the best that she can. And that sometimes when you're going through like an economic or emotional um, uh, difficulty or stressors that, that, that they can aid you. And I remember in that moment really thinking about the fact that she looked 
in my view, so old and sick. And she wasn't, it was not her fault. It was the society's fault that like, that's, that's what, to me, what I thought as a kid, that it's a, this is society's fault that why she's old and, but she's not old. She's just on that incredible amount of stress. And, and so she doesn't have other things and she's working so hard. Why is it that she's working so hard and she's still on that tremendous amount of stress and she looks so sick. And I think that that really stayed with me because as I um, graduated in high school and, and went to college, I, 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 I was really trying to understand um, what is it about the society that makes some groups of people okay, you know, um, financially okay health-wise and other people who work just as hard, why aren't they as okay? What, what is going on? Are there things in the society that benefit certain groups of people and, and disadvantage other groups of people and, and, and why? I think that those are the questions that in my undergraduate years, I was, I was, I was thinking about them a lot. Um, I, I, I thought about just businesses. I thought, thought about the, the economy. I thought about the laws around education and edu educational systems. And I was always really shocked because um, my mom was born with a disability and she's been in a wheelchair my, my entire life. And um, I'm always surprised that my mom went to school. My mom finished high school and went to a teacher training school and, and, and became a, 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 a K through what is similar to a K through 12 teacher. And under all circumstances, and a lot of people who had the same uh, issues that she had, um, they didn't go to school. First, because you know she was a girl child, girl children um, weren't necessarily perceived as she had to go to school. She was not just a girl child, she was a girl child with a severe disability. And I, I wondered about how that shaped the health of women more broadly. And I thought about what made it possible for her and, and can those resources be made available to other people who might experience that. And so I, I, I considered those questions a lot when I was in university. And I was thinking a lot about like, you know, educational outcomes, not necessarily health outcomes. Um, because I, I had connected health and education like significantly that like the more education you have, the healthier you would be. But that also wasn't true. Like that was shocking to me that I found that like it wasn't really that. But um, when I came to the U.S. and and I and I and I and I said this in the first um, critical race theory class that I took um, with the only black professor that I've had for my eight years of of higher education in the U.S. I only had one black professor, which also says something about who is where. And she was not even in my department. I went to a different department to take her class in critical risk theory. And I, and I remember sitting in that class and thinking about just race as a system and how it is a system that shapes every life outcome. The same way that when I was growing up in Cameroon, I thought about gender as a system. It was the same way that I think about race as a system, that opportunities are distributed. Um, the, the society values different things and has different expectations for different people and opportunities are distributed based on gender, the way opportunities are distributed based on race. But I, 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 never, really, I, I never really understood the level or the degree to which racism works in the US. Um, because I grew up in a society where everybody is black and I didn't, there were, there were, there was stratification based on a lot of things, but not on race. Um, and I grew up watching the Cosby show. So I thought every black person is a doctor or a lawyer in the, in the US, I never really understood. Um, but I think my own, my own experiences and, and questions that I had and um, questions that were asked of me and, and um, uh, racialized actions uh, towards me and, and a lot of people that I cared about, I think got me into thinking about race the same way that I thought about gender when I was growing up. And I started asking and studying about some of the racial inequities in health, in health outcomes. I, 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 I think I switched from educational outcomes to health outcomes, thinking about 
just the most basic survival, like what keeps us alive, um, who's more likely to live, what, 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 what kind of infant born in the US is more likely to live past their fifth birthday? And seeing that there were a lot of inequities by race, I, I started asking questions about why, what are some of the ways in which, um, in which racism shapes health. So I, that's kind of how I got interested in medical sociology, the, the, the combination of how our social institutions um, uh, shape health, the ways in which people think about health and, and, and illnesses. Are they personal? Are they public? Um, what, what is expected of people when they are sick? And then also looking at our healthcare institutions as their own society, as their own culture. How, how are healthcare institutions organized? What are some of the laws and, 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 and norms and values of healthcare system, of healthcare systems? Are they consistent with what the public needs, with what the society needs? Who, who decides, who decides that if I you know, fall in my house and crack my head open, that the government doesn't pay for that, or that we don't have, who decides that the government would send the fire department to come like save my house and, and rescue me? And not send me a check, but the ambulance would send me a check. Like, like how, 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 who, who decides, who decides what people can be offered as a, as as part of the society, as part of their 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 rights as individual mm -hmm. and as individuals, and who decides, who decides that you should pay for you should you should have health care because you can afford it, but you you should have the you should have a good you should have a, a you should have a, a street. Not, not necessarily because you can afford it. You should, yeah, the fire, if, if I call, the, if there was a fire here, the fire department wouldn't send me a check, but the ambulance would send me a check. So I, I, I think about how our laws and policies in the society are expectations of what, um, of what the social contract should be, of what people deserve as human beings and how we think about certain human beings, sometimes consciously or unconsciously, as more deserving or as less deserving. Like how how did it how did we get to a point in, in a society in a society in the country that was um, occupied and owned by by indigenous nations? How did we get to a point where if I say that oh there's an undocumented immigrant in the class that we immediately imagine a brown person from Mexico? We don't imagine a white person from Canada who has also over. So so I think about the ways in which as a society we get to this place where. We, we create different categories of people and then we, we distribute resources based on how we value them or, 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 or what we think of them. And then the ways in which we continue to perpetuate that. And I look at that in relation, uh, in relation to healthcare and in relation to the organization and, and distribution of health services. Yeah, I think that's, that's such an important um not only a, an important perspective, but an important intersection with your work, because I know a lot of times when we think about people in the academy, we think about these armchair historians, right? They, they theorize about all these things in the past, and then it doesn't go forward. Um, yeah, yeah. Right? But yeah, so there's, there's so much important work that like, you know, when you're, when you're involved in such heavy work, you have to think, how that transliterates and how it's it's you know the hi history is not past what we we say a lot in the museum and certainly yeah. as a medical sociologist you're not only studying um people and, and movements and how culture yeah. shape things right it has very real world implications and immediate real world implications yeah um, so can you can you define i know we don't usually think of the terms medical and sociologist in the same phrase. Um, so can you yeah. define uh, what that is in your field and how you yeah. how you interpret that phrase, what that means to you? Yeah, so for me, I think about the medical sociologist as a, as a person who studies healthcare. Um, so I studied three things, a person who studies healthcare, so like the healthcare system, then a person who studies ideas about health and illness as systems, right? as, as institutions on their own, as institutions that have policies, that have norms, as institutions that have power and that there's inherent distribution of power in those institutions. Um, so to me, the medical sociologist is an umbrella of the kind of sociologist that looks at 
um, what are the ways in which our social statuses and other social institutions um, interact to shape our health. So I don't, I wouldn't think about my health. I don't think about my health as strictly related to my biology. I think about my health as, as related to my, my, my health is relative to my social context. My health is relative to my identity, all kinds of identities, gender, race, age, immigrant, parent, all of that. I think about my health as also not just uh, a product of my now. So whatever health outcome or whatever my health is right now, it, it's not just about now. It's a accumulation of things over my life course, perhaps past traumas and experiences, experiences of, of people um, in my networks, people whose lives are linked to mine that, that shape my health. So I think about health in this sort of broad categorization. Um, and then I, I also, medical sociologist also thinks about how healthcare systems are organized. Who are the major players in the healthcare system? Who has more power, right? Like a lot of my own work as a sociologist is about thinking about who has power and why and how that power shapes health outcomes. So if I think about it in the context of a hospital, a, a, a doctor, a doctor patient relationship, um, we typically often think about the doctor as the person which, with power and the doctor has a lot of power, but the ways in which the doctor negotiates, interacts with the patient um, contributes to healing beyond more than the medicine itself. So I think about doctor-patient relationships. I think about things that shape expectations of, a, a lot of, of, of my work tells my research, like people know immediately the first couple of minutes, even less, the first 10 seconds with a healthcare provider, people can often see whether that provider genuinely cares about them. Mm -hmm. And it shapes everything going forward. It shapes their expectations of the provider, it shows whether they trust the provider. And, and we've had with COVID-19 a lot of issues around what medical mistrust is, where, where it comes from and what it means. So understanding um, how, how people bring the social context of their lives into the clinical encounter and how that shapes their interactions with providers is, is also part of what I do um, as a medical sociologist. That if my experiences as a Black queer woman in, in Pennsylvania um, on the streets, right? Like if I say I had a negative encounter with the police, if I left that encounter and went to my job at Lehigh, I don't leave that behind. I, I bring that with me. If I went to uh, in my interaction with uh, my gynecologist, for example, I, I don't leave that behind. I bring that with me. And I think about the ways in which that shapes what or not I trust, I want to listen to the healthcare provider. But, but, but whatever provider's own history, their own experiences, their own perceptions about who I am also shapes their interactions with me. Their own training about like how they see patients and, 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 and how they interact with patients. I've, 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 in, in my research, I've had people, people say that how providers, healthcare providers have, have made assumptions about their lives, about who they are, about, especially in mental health. I, I, uh, one time a, 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 an, an interviewee told me that the reason they are never going to go see a, a, a psychologist ever again is because as soon as they went in there, the psychologist said, it must have been really hard for you growing up you know, without your, your, your father, that were, were they incarcerated? These kinds of assumptions that we, we make <laughs> about, about different groups of people. Like I shared earlier, my mom is in a wheelchair and my mom was living with me in Allentown. Um, every single time we would go to one of her doctor's appointments, okay, this, this woman can read and write. This woman is a teacher. This woman made me. And she, every time they were asking her something, they never looked at her, they were asking me. They, were, they would ask me. And, and one time I just, I said, you know, she's right there. You can, you can talk to her. Yeah. And it's the, the idea that like, oh, because she's, she's in a wheelchair. It, 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 the ways in which our like notions and ideas about people shape, shape how we interact with them and what that means for their health. 
I think it's it's a lot of what I do as a medical sociologist. And I also, again, I talked about like the role of, of power and I think about how power plays out in different institutions. And so right now I, I, I do a lot of work around the healthcare institution, around policing and um, uh, uh, so law enforcement and the carceral system and then immigration and housing um, and higher education. But there are, there are all kinds of other systems like the same the same oppression or, or, or racism or whatever that plays out in higher education is the same, is the exact same thing that plays out in, in hospitals, is the exact same thing that plays out in, in, in law enforcement. The, the only issue is that we don't have the viral tips that we see for law enforcement, but, but harm is also being caused, right? It might not be visceral and, and really like, like dramatic, the way, like, like George Floyd, for example, but it doesn't mean that the ways in which racism plays out in other institutions, in our boardrooms, in our you know, universities, in our hospitals, in our housing facilities and transportation facilities, it doesn't mean that those forms of racism are less harmful uh, to health. And so I, my work tries to look at all of these structural things and structural systems that shape the health of, of, of people who are marginalized, but I also fundamentally look at the cause of that marginalization. How did we as a society decide to categorize people by race? And how did we as a society decide to you know, perform a genocide of, of indigenous people and, and genocides of other people? Like, like what's happening in Ukraine? Like how do we as a society decide that other people's lives are of less value? And what are some of the ways in which we cannot continue to reinforce that? And I think it's it's really important that we that we underline for viewers who are in the the Zoom now, and for viewers who will watch this when it's up on YouTube, that that inequities are not just imbalances, right? They're not inequalities. Inequities mm -hmm. are on a structural level, right? So, yeah. can you, you you've talked at length quite a bit um, about some yeah. of the structural inequities that that you study? Um, yeah. Can you tell us the importance of examining some of those inequities from a medical sociology standpoint, right? So what are some concrete ways um, that say uh, someone living in the south side of Bethlehem yeah. may be treated differently than someone living in the north side of Bethlehem? Yeah, so the, the reason why I, I really think about inequities and I, 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 and I don't, try to study them and understand them to be cool. So like, hey, look at them, but, but, but it's thinking about how to dismantle them, right? Like it's, it's because they, they are unjust, they are unfair, and most importantly, they are avoidable. They, they, don't, just, they don't just happen. And I, one of the things that really frustrates me, Sarah, is when people say that like, um, oh, it's the system, the system is broken, the system. The system functions because there are people that, that sustain the system. The system are not like the system is not just there doing its own thing, like 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 behind the man behind the curtain and just like doing things. Yeah. The, the, the system. There are people that are in charge of systems, and the systems function because we have laws and policies and actions and beliefs that continue to sustain the system. And until we 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 think about things differently. And, and, and think about how the systems can function differently, then, then we want to change the system. But a lot of times people like, oh, this is the, the system is really broken. Like, yeah, what can we do? And we throw our hands in the air, but like the system is a system because of people. And, 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 and so um, I think that that's, that's very important to think about, but I, but I do walk around um, uh, uh, systemic inequities, systemic injustices, because they are avoidable, they are, they are preventable, and they really harm health. And oppression um, and systemic violence, systemic inequities are productive. And, 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 and saying this, I mean that, that the, 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 the oppression that happens in one system causes and sustains the oppression that happens in another system. So if we think about racial residential segregation or housing segregation, or just think about something as basic as a housing in South Bethlehem, right? We know that we have a, a society structured in such a way that our public schools are funded by property taxes. So then <laughs> that just means that neighborhoods that are residentially segregated, that people who live in, in those neighborhoods now are dealing with educational injustices. 
because their schools are under-resourced. Because their schools are under-resourced, it means that the children that graduate from that school may or may not graduate from that school are less likely to get into other, like it just, it continues. They are less likely to get into other more resourced institutions. It also means that because people who live in residentially segregated neighborhoods, that it also means that they are more exposed to all kinds of other inequities. Lead in the housing, for example, asthma rates are astronomical. Food insecurity, right? Like, you know, people, people just don't, then there's the environmental racism part of it where like the housing codes and the laws are not, are not as enforced as they would have been enforced in neighborhoods that, that have more resources. Because of poverty, poverty is, 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 um, uh, poverty is um, policed, right? We, we, poverty is, when people are poor, people, they are more likely to be policed. Police presence in, in disproportionately poor neighborhoods um, is significantly higher than police presence in wealthier neighborhoods. But if in disproportionately poor neighborhoods, there's a crisis that requires police intervention, they are less likely to intervene. They are more likely to actually surveil um, neighborhoods and, and respond to symptoms of inequality, responding to homelessness, responding to, to, to indicators of domestic violence, responding just, just over policing neighborhoods that that, that don't have access to, to resources. And so then what does that lead to? That leads to more of a sort of school to prison pipeline situation. And so the, the, the violence just gets productive. And then once people have left school and, and their, their first contact with the criminal justice system was through their schools, it, it just, it, 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 it continues. The employment outcomes uh, for them become even worse. And then, you know, it, it, it's, it's that, one act of violence doesn't just harm the system or the immediate context where that violence occurs. It, 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 and that's, and, and that's, why, that's why oppression is, is systemic. It doesn't just stay in one place. It shapes, it shapes other systems and it shapes other institutions um, in ways that are really um, harmful and are, that are really damaging for health. And so it's, when, I, when, I, when I think about solutions, I think about what are some of the systems that are kind of at the center, right? That, that, that are kind of at the center and that connect with other systems. And I think about what are the ways in which there can be collaboration between the healthcare system and the criminal justice system, between the criminal justice system and the educational system in, in, ways, that don't, don't, in ways that don't harm people. And, and when there is the other issue around systemic inequities and injustices, is that when something else happens, like a crisis, people who are already exposed to systemic injustices are impacted the most. It doesn't matter what crisis. It could be the Great Depression, it could be the, the, the recession, it could be the climate crisis, right? Like when Katrina happened, who were the people that were disproportionately impacted, right? Even Hurricane Sandy, right? People who are, and then if, when it's a health crisis like COVID-19, again, people who are already experiencing uh, who are already structurally marginalized, who are experiencing a lot of structural violence are people who are harmed the most. And so our response when in a, in a time of crisis to, to like address these things and fix them is good, but, but what we really need to do is to address the broader structural inequities that made particular groups of people more vulnerable um, to this crisis uh, to begin with. Yeah, so we, we may have a shorter Zoom than I had anticipated. Um, I know just enough technology to be dangerous. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, what I, what I want to focus on as our last question, um, building yeah. on the, the themes that you've talked about, so much of your work is based around community, um, accepting yeah. community needs, uplifting voices, yeah. actively working to rectify the inequities that are faced by communities of color and marginalized yeah. communities um, and black communities in particular. And yeah. in your writings, you, you propose um, three specific guiding principles um, yeah. for advancing equity, right? Authentic engagement, defining and living values and embracing accountability. So yeah. can, you, can you elaborate on those and how you would, how you would recommend that folks who are 
looking into doing sociological work or doing any kind of participatory work like that, um, yeah. how they can take those principles and apply them to their work and, and just in daily life moving forward. Yeah, so uh, uh, authentic engagement, I think it's really about getting to know people. Well, one of the things that you said earlier that has been my gospel <laughs> for a while is the, the idea of not doing research away from people, like sitting somewhere, doing your, your research and doing stuff that's not really relevant. Mm -hmm. I think that we should think about how our work matters to the people who are impacted the most. Um, people who are impacted the most by systemic oppression are often left out of decision-making around what policies might be. And the people who make, who make policies often make policies that reflect their own perspectives and their ideas. The problem is that the people who make policies are usually not the people that are impacted the most by those policies and shocked by, by injustices. And I think that finding other ways of knowing grounding our knowledge, our research, our policy recommendations, our practices on the experiences of, of communities impacted the most is really, really important. Thinking about how, how they can generate knowledge, the, the knowledge of their lived experiences to shape these policies about what matters to them is important. So that to me, what I mean, the, the community, the, the, the really being engaged is like, like, like making sure that your work is grounded in the experiences of people who are impacted the most. And then um, living out our values. Like, like I, I think a lot of people have these really great values about the things that they care about. A lot of people care about social justice, economic justice, food justice, all of that. But I think they don't make those values known because they are free. And I think we have to get past the point where we are more like that it's more comfortable for us to not speak up about injustices than it is to like just be quiet and let it go. Like living out our values means that we take risk. And sometimes it's risky to interrupt um, oppression. It's risky to interrupt something as basic as a sexist joke or racist joke. And it's, it's but we have to be brief. We have to be more uncomfortable not saying anything than the other way around. Um, and then the third thing about accountability, I think this is a really big one, Sarah. Um, a lot of our systems, um, we, 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 we want to do work that's meaningful and valuable for communities, but there's no way that the communities can hold us accountable, right? What, what, who holds us accountable? And so I think it's really important for us to think about ways in which we are accountable to communities. We are accountable to people who we, we want to serve. We are accountable to people who, whose lives we, we, we care about. That we, and being accountable to communities means listening to communities. It means that it's not just about having communities, communities have a seat at the table, but it's communities able to tell us no. Communities able to say, this is not what we want. Communities. And us being able to go back to communities and say, look, we really, really messed up. We've caused a lot of harm. Um, that acknowledgement and that honesty and that being able to say we caused harm, I think it's really important for building trust. For good reason, a lot of communities don't trust institutions. It doesn't matter what kind of institution, especially academic institutions, uh, healthcare institutions. A lot of communities don't trust institutions. And I think one of the ways of getting that trust is being accountable for our own actions. I have a mother in the community who always says, you're, the, you're responsible for your own actions. You're the only person that can, the only thing that you can fix is your, is your own actions. You may not be able to fix an entire system, but you can fix your actions. And so our institutions need to be able to be accountable when we are wrong and recognize that. Um, that's the only way we build trust and, and do something that's sustainable. Yes, absolutely. I just I want to say too, as we as we close out, um, oh, we do have a question. Yeah. Thank you so much. We will answer this in the the brief time that we have left. Um, I will okay. read out. Thank you so much for presenting today. I'm a black female physician at the beginning of my career. It's fascinating to think about how medicine and sociology intersect. I think about how to engage and empower my patient populations that are mistrusting of the medical system. Any advice? Who you could write well, a dissertation. <laughs> I can't, I, I'll, I'll tell you what works for me. And, and we are work, doing a project now that is specifically around trust. 
Um, the, my advice is that you should always take the patient's word for it. You're an expert in treating their illness. You might even end up being an expert in treating cancer, but you don't have the lived experience of dealing with cancer and going from hospital to hospital or whatever their experiences are. And so I think really valuing the expertise of patients' experiences is really, really important. I don't know what it means. And I've thought about this a lot when patients say that I want my clinicians to treat me as a person. This does not mean that you'd have two hours conversations with, with every patient that comes into your exam room, but it means that you're able to, to, to see them as people, not just as cases, and, and recognize that they are an expert in their experience, not, not you. You're an expert in providing care. They are an expert in their own experiences with illness. That is wonderful. Um, I just want to say in, in closing, I'm sorry that we didn't have um, more time. And yes, I agree, Kim. I could listen to you talk for hours. Um, it's, it's always a pleasure. I know we I don't get we to connect. <laughs> Um, I, we, we don't get to connect that often, but it's, it's always a, a pleasure and a privilege to sit down or in some cases meeting you at protests yeah. and standing up. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it's, it's, always, um, it's always a joy and thank you for, for everything. And I will, as I said in the chat, I will email um, the, the YouTube link out to everyone once the closed captioning generates. All right, thank you so much, Sarah. Thank and you I'll so come much, back if, if, at some point if you want me to. Absolutely. Have a great day. I just day, feel everybody. like this was really short, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get better, I promise. <laughs> no Thank problem. Have a good Enjoy night. Enjoy the everybody. rest of your evening. You too. Yeah. Bye.